The year is 2794. Your security officer aboard the UESC Marathon, a massive colonization ship built from carving out the Martian moon of Deimos. After beginning the colonization of the planet Tau Ceti IV, the Marathon finds itself overrun by aliens known as the Four. It's up to you and the ship's main AI, Leela, to save the remaining humans on the ship and the colony. On this episode of Knee Deep in the Dead, we explore one of the Macintosh's first major FPS hits, Marathon. Following off on their hit first-person shooter game Pathways Into Darkness, a relatively small team began development on a follow-up game. Unlike its PC counterpart at the time, an id software game called Doom, they wanted more focus on a story. This story is relayed through the game's many computer terminals and tells of the security officer and Leela's attempts to thwart the invasion of the Four. The Marathon's automatic manufacturing systems have finished making replacement circuits. There are three circuits. Each should be in its manufacturing holding chamber. With luck, the alien viruses have not infiltrated the manufacturing systems, but even if they had, I would have no way of knowing. The attacks on my systems are growing more steady. If the counterattack is not able to remove some of the computer infiltrators, then I will eventually succumb. It is absolutely imperative that a counterattack begin as soon as possible. The marathon is not defenseless, and we can't let it be taken without a fight. Durandal is the AI in charge of the ship's autonomous systems, and as his presence in the game increases, his terminal messages become increasingly threatening. Strive for your next breath. Believe that with it you can do more than with the last one. Use your breath to power your capacities. Capacity to kill, to maim, to destroy. And just where do your capacities come from? Why do you always go where I want, and do what I say? Perhaps you're just running a fool's errand, doing everything as I've planned, never able to change your course. You would do well to believe that I know the outcome of your battle with the Four already, just as I can decipher the chaotic motion of gas molecules in the clouds of Tau Ceti Four. Or, perhaps, that is not the case. Perhaps you are doing what you were meant to do, your human mentality screams for vengeance and thrives on the violence that you say you can hardly endure. Your father told you as a child to always fight with honor, but to always fight. Do you care about honor, or do you use honor as an excuse? An excuse to exist in a violent world. In the officer's quest to free the marathon, he utilizes weapons including the Magnum, a handgun capable of being dual-wielded, the MA-75 Assault Rifle, which happens to be horribly inaccurate when shooting, but much more useful with its grenade launcher. The Zeus-class Fusion Pistol, an energy weapon that has a secondary charge mode. The Spunker SSM Rocket Launcher, fairly self-explanatory. A flamethrower, also fairly easy to comprehend, that literally fries four like chicken. And an alien weapon that is simply called the Alien Weapon. The game takes place over the course of 27 levels that sends you to the various locations aboard the Marathon and onto the attacking four ship. Some of these levels include an open to space area housing the Marathon's main transmitter, the engineering section to stop the four from detonating a bomb, and aboard a four ship to kill the controller of the cybernetics fit race, freeing them from its control. Marathon's gameplay doesn't do very much different from other shooters developed in this era. You go through the levels from point A to point B, killing the enemies in your path. Though unlike a lot of shooters from this time frame, you sometimes have varying goals on each level, such as exploring everything or killing all of the aliens. You also have the ability to aim up or down, an element missing from many games of this era. However, there are several design decisions that made the playthrough somewhat unpleasant. Save games are done at the various save stations around the Marathon. In order to save, you have to go to these spots. Sometimes they're right at the beginning, and sometimes spaced evenly. There's also a good deal of platforming and environmental hazards to move around that, like in Rise of the Triad, are made more difficult with the limited view. 
Other issues include how your characters feel very flowy a lot of the time, making precise movements even more challenging. Other rather odd and unique design choices include basing ammo on a clip system. However, there's no way to actually reload your weapon aside from emptying it, leading to scenarios where you'd come face to face with alien hordes and stuck in a reloading animation. The overall shooting also wasn't very satisfying. The enemies didn't really respond to being attacked, outside from some slight stuttering. There were also times when the goals of the level weren't clearly stated, leading to aimless wandering for quite some time to figure out how to exit. The core element of Marathon, though, is its commitment to its story, but also, possibly the most important, is how much of a focus it places on lore and backstory. Consoles explain secrets and events leading up to the start of the game, and even events happening as you play. While I don't personally list Marathon as one of my favorite FPSs that I've played, its importance in the development of the genre is not to be understated. But there was an FPS from this era even more influential, one that helped popularize the genre even more than Wolfenstein 3D did, and we'll be covering it on the next episode. Until then, my friends, as always, game on and take care.